rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. Globalism is the number one issue in the current presidential campaign. Globalists believe the time for the nation state is over. They contend mankind is destined to merge into a system of one world government, which they refer to as the new world order. To express it in a nutshell, Will America retain our sovereignty or will we eventually become just another member state under the jurisdiction of the United Nations? The Bible prophesies a one world government for the very near future and it's not going to end up good. This present election may well determine whether America becomes an integral part of that one world government or whether we decide we want to maintain our national sovereignty. Globalism, I call it the 800 pound gorilla in the living room. Now the tragedy is many people don't even know what the term means. Donald Trump has taken to mention it fairly often he is against globalism, and yet the average American, if you said to them, so what is globalism? What's it all about? Most of them would shrug their shoulders and just not know or take a wild stab at it. Now, because of that, I decided I wanted to bring to you the definition of globalism. Here's what the dictionary says, a national geopolitical policy in which the entire world is regarded as the appropriate sphere for a state's influence, the entire world. The development of social, cultural, technological, or economic networks that transcend national boundaries. It's also referred to as globalization. Now, Strobe Talbot probably said it most succinctly in his article in Time Magazine, July the 20th of 1992, called Birth of the Global Nation. Here's what Talbot said. In the next century, nations as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. You say, well, what do I care what Strobe Talbot thinks? Well, we probably all should care because he said that in 1992, in 1994, he was summoned to the White House to serve in the Clinton State Department from 1994 until the end of the term of the Clintons in the year 2000. So he is the embodiment of what the Clintons believe about the future of our world. National sovereignty will cease to exist in the 21st century. We'll all answer to a single global authority. Now what makes this so haunting is that the Bible prophesies about the near future. And there are several specific prophecies about one world government and about the coming one world government just ahead of us. Let me read a couple of them to you. Daniel chapter number seven, verse 23 says it this way. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse or different from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Now to put this in context, 
the passage goes on to say that he will launch a time of religious persecution called the Great Tribulation until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that Great Tribulation will last for three and a half years. So the establishment of this one world government spoken of here in Daniel 7, 23 is going to actually take place about three and a half years before the second coming of Jesus and the battle of Armageddon. That world government will be at the zenith of its power during that final three and a half years. So here we are in a red hot presidential campaign and the number one issue has become globalism versus national sovereignty. Let me give you the other scripture. It's Revelation 13, 7. Revelation 13, 1 through 8 is devoted to the Antichrist, his one world government. And in verse 7, it says it this way. And it was given unto him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. That's the true Christians. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Well, the dream of one world government is not a new dream, but it has been revived with a vengeance beginning at the first part of the 20th century and escalating dramatically right now. After World War I, they called it the Great War. It was the greatest war the world's ever seen. 8.2 million dead. Our president, Woodrow Wilson, said, we've got to stop this carnage. We can't ever let this happen again. And he came up with a plan, the League of Nations. However, there were members of our Congress that quickly saw through this plan that in order for it to work like Woodrow Wilson said it should work, the United States would have to surrender its sovereignty and merge into a one world governmental system. Consequently, our Congress wisely voted no, and the League of Nations was dead on arrival. It quickly faded into obscurity. However, it wasn't totally disregarded. A short time after this, Franklin D. Roosevelt placed on the U.S. dollar bill, and it's still there today, the phrase novus ordo seclorum, which is Latin for new world order. Novus is new, ordo is order, and seclorum is secular or world. Why in the world did our president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, put the term new world order on the back of our dollar bill? Well, for good reason, because Roosevelt was a believer in a one world governmental system. However, 20 years after World War I, once again, the United States of America was embroiled in World War II. This time, there wasn't 8.2 million dead. This time, 52 million. By now, the nations are in panic. What's going to happen? I mean, this war was closed out with a nuclear weapon. What happens if there's a thousand nuclear weapons unleashed upon this world? Will we destroy all human, plant, and animal life off the face of the earth? Because now we have the ability to do that. So the nations of the world came together under the leadership of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was a dreamer of a new world order and founded a new organization called the United Nations. It actually was a continuation of the League of Nations. They actually inherited the furniture and some of the property of the League of Nations. But they put a new face on it called the United Nations. And it was designed from the outset to be a one world government. Now, it did have a flaw. The flaw was that still the United States was not willing to totally surrender its sovereignty, so we demanded veto power, ultimate veto power, over the decisions of the UN Security Council where the big decisions are made. Well, when we demanded veto power, the other victor nations of World War II said, well, if you get it, we get it. So when everything was settled, the United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, China, the big five, were given veto power. All the rest of the nations of the world 
found themselves already in a one world government over which they had no veto power. But because of the veto power, enmity immediately out of World War II, enmity between Russia, the Soviet Union, and the United States of America heated up. It produced what is called the Cold War. So from 1945 until 1989, we lived through this brinkmanship when we went to bed every night, wondering if the Russians would push the buttons, wondering if the United States would push those nuclear buttons or not, wondering if we would ever even wake up at all. We lived that way for 44 years or so. However, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the tearing down of the Iron Curtain in 1989, it was announced the Cold War is over. We're moving into a new world order. President George Herbert Walker Bush, who was in power at the time, along with Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and Pope John Paul II, regarded as the world's strongest religious leader, they all came together uh, within 20 days of the fall of the Berlin Wall at Malta. And they came out of those meetings announcing the birth of the new world order. It was a term that not many of us were very familiar with, even though it had been on the back of our dollar bill, yet it was written in Latin, and so we hadn't really paid much attention to it. However, these three leaders, they meant what they said. They believed they were giving birth to a new world order. Listen to what George Herbert Walker Bush said shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, many of us recall President Bush talking about an emerging new world order. In 1989, Bush stole, told the students of Texas A&M University, perhaps the world order of the future will truly be a family of nations. Later, Bush, shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, said, we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations listen to this term, in the words of George Bush, George Bush Sr., a new world order. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. An order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. I want you to remember what our subject is today, globalism. Do we believe in a one world government, a new world order, or do we want to retain national sovereignty and continue to be an independent nation? We have declared our independence, but many people think we should renounce that declaration and adopt instead a declaration of interdependence. Now here's something else Bush Sr. said. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. And again, you can listen to this on videos on the internet. You don't have to take my word for it. He stated these things. Bush Sr. father said, the world can therefore seize the opportunity to fulfill the long held promise of a new world order, long held, yes. Woodrow Wilson held it, Franklin D. Roosevelt had, held it, many others held it, now George Herbert Walker Bush holds it. Now, on the heels of the fall of the Berlin Wall, when everybody was saying, oh, it's gonna be peace on earth, goodwill toward men, all of a sudden, Saddam Hussein decided he could invade Kuwait and claim it's all riches for his own. Well, he did, and George Herbert Walker Bush as the leader of the strongest nation in the free world, felt like he had to go against Saddam Hussein. And when he was marshalling the forces, he gathered together 29 different nations that contributed either troops or resources to this effort against Saddam Hussein in 1991. When he did this, George Bush said, I want to make clear to the Iraqi people, this is not the United States of America against Iraq, this is Saddam Hussein against the world. Bush already was thinking about a one world governance situation. He went on to say, the world can therefore seize the opportunity 
in the Persian Gulf crisis to fulfill the long held promise of a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. So obviously George Herbert Walker Bush was a big believer in the new world order. Some people called him an internationalist. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me pause a moment because I'm barely scratching the surface here today, although I have a lot more material for you. But we produced a DVD called Master Plan of the Dragon, the dragon being Satan. Satan has a master plan for this world and this DVD will shock you to your feet because we tell things in here that haven't really been told before. What's Satan's master plan and how is it affecting us right now, right today? And then the other DVD we produced, one of the most popular we've ever done, World Government Forming Now. Two DVDs, Master Plan of the Dragon, World Government Forming Now. If you'd like to have a copy of these, pick up the phone and call us right now. The number to call, 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Or you can go to our website, endtime.com, E-N-D-T-I-M-E.com. And there you'll see on our store a place for you to order these two videos. Let me tell you what they are one more time. Master Plan of the Dragon, World Government Forming Now. You need to see both of these because it may change the way you vote in this present election. But whether that happens or not, at least you understand what globalism is and why it is the 800 pound gorilla in the living room. Well, as history marched on after World War II, the European Union was founded. It was quite a process, but eventually it came together to the point today we have 27 nations who now have their own constitution it's called the European Union. They now have 500 million people. The U.S. has 315 million. And also the European Union passed the U.S. economically in 2007. It is a power that is laying low, but it won't lay low for long. It has a very pivotal role to play in the prophecies of the end time. Now, let's talk about the battle to bring the United States into a world government. The World Federalist Organization has worked tirelessly because they are a firm believer that world government is the answer. And the World Federalist Organization each year gives away an award to the person that year that did the most working toward one world government. It's called the Norman Cousins Award because Norman Cousins was a big believer in one world government. In the year 2000, this award was given to Walter Cronkite for some of you that are old enough to remember, he was the voice of news in America for 30 years. Listen to what Walter Cronkite had to say about world government. It seems to many of us that if we are to avoid the eventual catastrophic world conflict, we must strengthen the United Nations as a first step toward a world government patterned after our own government with a legislator, an executive, a judiciary, and police to enforce its international laws and keep the peace. To do that, of course, we Americans will have to yield up some of our sovereignty. That would be a bitter pill. It would take a lot of courage, a lot of faith in the new world order. But the American colonies did it once and brought forth one of the most nearly perfect unions the world has ever seen. Mr. Walter Cronkite was an avid believer in a one world governmental system. President Bill Clinton also is an internationalist. He believes in a one world governmental system and during his presidency, he pushed the concept forward as much as he could. I pulled up today his speech, which he gave on September the 22nd of 1997 before the UN General Assembly in there. He made a statement. He said, it's time 
for the International Criminal Court. Let me give you the quote exactly. Before the century ends, we should establish a permanent international court to prosecute the most serious violations of humanitarian law. Well, that proposal immediately flipped the world community into action. By the very next year, by July the 17th of 1998, they had put together what's called the International Criminal Court Statue of Rome, and it came into force with enough ratifications by 2002. And today, every single person on the sound of my voice could be taken before that International Criminal Court at the Hague in Holland, and you could be put on trial without protection of the U.S. Constitution, nor the Bill of Rights, that's all I have time to tell you about. Nevertheless, it was proposed by none other than former President Bill Clinton. Mr. David Rockefeller, one of the most powerful people of the last 100 years, also chairman of the board at Chase Bank until his retirement. He said this in his memoirs on page 405. Some even believe we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalist and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. Listen carefully. Rockefeller speaking. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. So, Memoirs by David Rockefeller, page 405. I think it was written in 2002. David Rockefeller also said this because he was a big mover behind the scenes. He had meetings with the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations. He was the founder of the Council on Foreign Relations. Well, actually, he was the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He also was the founder of the Trilateral Commission. And so all of these meetings that were always held in secret, listen to what David Rockefeller said. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion. For almost 40 years, all these supposedly impartial news media people, now Rockefeller's giving them credit for keeping their mouth shut for almost 40 years. He went on to say, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the work is now much more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government, the supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practiced in past centuries. David Rockefeller said, founder of the Trilateral Commission, in a meeting to the Trilateral Commission in June of 1992. Now, Mr. James Warburg, who was part of the very powerful European Warburg family, he came here to the United States, and he was the person mainly responsible for writing the Federal Reserve Act, which was adopted in 1913. Now, his son, James Warburg Jr., was testifying before a Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs, and here's what he said. He said to them, we shall have a world government whether or not you like it, by conquest or by consent. Now, he was a CFR member, that Council on Foreign Relations member, and he was speaking to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on February the 17th, 1950. You can check it out in the congressional record. Here's what Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter said concerning globalism in 1952, the UN is but a long range international banking apparatus clearly set up for financial and economic profit by a small group of powerful one world revolutionaries hungry for profit and power. Now, Curtis Dahl, FDR's son-in-law, made that statement, the son-in-law of FDR. He, his, the title of his book was My Exploited Father-in-Law. Whether FDR was exploited or whether he knew what was going on, well, that's another discussion for another day. Now, here's what Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter said. The real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise power from behind the scenes. 
We've all been suspicious about that, haven't we? Senator William Fulbright said the case for government by elites is irrefutable. He was the former chairman of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he stated that in a 1963 symposium entitled, The Elite and the Electorate is Government by the People Possible. Then former Congressman John Rarick in 1971 said this, the Council on Foreign Relations is the establishment. Oh, you've heard that term establishment in this present presidential campaign? Well, he spills the beans. The Council on Foreign Relations, headed by David Rockefeller, who was for one world government, that's the establishment. Not only does it have influence and power in key decision-making positions at the highest level of government to apply pressure from above, but it also announces the uses, uses individuals, announces and uses individuals and groups to bring pressure from below to justify the high-level decisions for converting the U.S., from a sovereign constitutional republic into a servile member state of a one world dictatorship. Here's what Richard Gardner said. The new world order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. But in the end, run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece will accomplish much more than old fashioned frontal assault. Council on Foreign Relations member Richard Gardner. That was in the 1974 issue of the CFR's Foreign Affairs Journal. Quickly, one more. England's Prime Minister Tony Blair. We are all internationalists now, whether we like it or not. He continues saying, on the eve of a new millennium, this is after the Berlin Wall fell, we are now in a new world. We need new rules for international cooperation and new ways of organizing our international institutions. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have time for. One more time. Master Plan of the Dragon, that's one DVD. And also, World Government, forming now to get your copy. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 800-363-8463. Or go to endtime.com. You've been listening to Globalism on End of the Age. Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Almighty God in 550 BC, when the book of Daniel was written, made a sovereign decision that he would hide the understanding of Bible prophecy until a particular time. You and I live in that time right now. Almighty God is now revealing these prophecies to us, not because we're more spiritual, not because we're more intelligent, but simply because He decided to put end-time prophecy and its fulfillment in the hands of the end-time church. Why? Undoubtedly, for the purpose of generating one last great revival. There's a specific prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So right while the Antichrist is corrupting people with his false doctrines and with his flatteries, yet there's going to be a people who are strong for God. They're going to do exploits. And their assignment is the ones who understand should be instructing others who don't understand. To order End Time Ministries bestseller, Understanding the End Time, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. In case you're just joining us, we're talking today about globalism. I call it the 800-pound gorilla in the living room. It's the thing that, well, it's the critical issue of this present presidential campaign. All politicians are either globalists or else they believe in national sovereignty. There is a strong move that is almost reaching the finish line 
to yield national sovereignty to the world government apparatuses. We already have the World Bank, the International uh, Monetary Fund. We have the International Criminal Court. We have the World Trade Organization. We have the World Health Organization and many other global organizations, too numerous to count. So the people that believe in world government have been working day and night to push us into it. But we Americans have got this very dearly held thing called national sovereignty. Our Declaration of Independence is a very precious document to us. And our independence is also a very precious right that we have. And we do not want to yield it. But there are many now that have been educated by the elite through our colleges, through our media, that are being sold on the idea we need a one world governmental system. Well, we're talking about that today and I'm in the process right now of giving some quotes and I wanna go back and I want to uh, quickly pick up with Mr. Tony Blair. The first part of his quote, he said, we are all internationalists now, whether we like it or not. He's saying this right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. He continued saying on the eve of a new millennium, we are now in a new world. We need new rules for international cooperation and new ways of organizing our international institutions. Now listen to what else he said. He said, today the impulse towards interdependence is immeasurably greater. We are witnessing the beginnings of a new doctrine of international community. Think about this. In 1999, Tony Blair said, Globalization has trans transformed our economies and our working practices, but globalism is not just economic. It is also a political and security phenomenon. Now, I gave you before one of the quotes by Walter Cronkite, but you need to hear this one too. In his book entitled A Reporter's Life, Walter Cronkite said, a system of world order, preferably a system of world government, is mandatory. The proud nations someday will see the light and for the common good, have you heard that term common good a lot? Yeah, you, you sure, sure have. For the common good and their own survival, yield up their precious sovereignty. Cronkite told a BBC newsman, Tim Sebastian, I think we are realizing that we are going to have to have an international rule of law. He added, we need not only an executive to make international law, but we need the military forces to enforce that law. Cronkite also said, American people are going to begin to realize that perhaps they are going to have to yield some sovereignty to an international body to enforce world law. Let me pause a moment to say this to all of you. It is impossible to yield some sovereignty. Sovereignty means you're the ultimate rule. If you have a rule above you, you're no longer sovereign. We as Americans, we only believe in one sovereignty, that's God. That's the reason our, our uh, Pledge of Allegiance says one nation under God does not say one nation under the UN. It says one nation under God. So we acknowledge his sovereignty. If we ever renounce his sovereignty, we are destined to move toward a one world government as fast as we can go because you're either gonna serve one master or you're gonna serve another. Let me tell you what Barry Goldwater said in his book entitled, With No Apologies. Former Republican presidential nominee Barry Goldwater wrote the Trilateral Commission, remember, founded by David Rockefeller, who said, I'm very proud to say I'm for one world government. The Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial and banking interest by seizing control of the political government of the United States. Barry Goldwater, presidential candidate. What was that, 1964? 
The Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power. Listen to the four centers of power. Political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. What's ecclesiastical? That's religious. Now, political, monetary, and religious, these are the three things that are included in Revelation 13. The whole chapter is devoted to the one world government of the end time. The first eight verses are devoted to the political power, the one world government, and its ruler, the Antichrist. Verse 11 through 15 is devoted to the false prophet and his one world religious system that he will uh, ally with the one world government of the Antichrist. And then the last three verses, verse 16 through 18, are devoted to the monetary system. Every person will be required to have a mark or a number in order to hold a job, in order to be able to buy or sell. Isn't it amazing that these things are being promoted by the politicians of the day that they think are good? The Bible depicts them as evil and terrible. Now what the Trilateral Commission intends to create is a worldwide economic power superior to the political governments of the nation states involved. I'm still speaking the words of Goldwater. As managers and creators of the system, they will rule the future. I want to go back to David Rockefeller again. Back in 1991, the founder of the CFR, David Rockefeller praised the major media for their complicity in helping to facilitate the globalist agenda. And we've already told you the rest of that, so I'm gonna move on down to our next quote that's so important for all of us to hear. Okay, Henry Kissinger, revered to be the most brilliant foreign policy advisor in the last 100 years. In 2009, Barack Obama had just been elected. He was not quite in office yet. It was before his inauguration. And Henry Kissinger was asked what President Obama needed to know the most. And here's what he said. He was asked by a reporter the most important thing that Barack Obama could accomplish as president. He said, I think his task will be develop, to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. Now, we were in the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and Kissinger was speaking from the floor of Wall Street, and he said, look, I don't think he should worry about the crisis. It's really a great opportunity because everybody's scared, everybody's looking for answers. He can now introduce international structures of economic control that will create a new world order. And did he ever do that? They expanded the G7 to the G20. That's the group of seven to the group of 20, which meet together regularly now to determine the economic policy of the world. And they also formed a new global economic strategies board and that board oversees. Have you noticed all the bankers are running scared? Have you noticed when you go to open a bank account, they'll ask you your life history? Uh, they call it Know Your Customer. Isn't that a nice, friendly name? That's not the bank's choice. I know. I've talked to the bankers. The government has mandated that they collect information on you and every bit of that information goes straight into your governmental profile. I know what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Gideon Rockman the chief foreign affairs commentator for the Financial Times, which is reputed to be the most influential economic publication in the world. It's published every day. In his column, Rockman said, I have never believed that there is a secret United Nations plot to take over the U.S. But for the first time in my life, I think the formation of some sort of world government is plausible. Now he's talking at the time of the economic crisis, 2008, 2009. He went on to say, a world government would involve much more than cooperation between nations. It would be an entity with state-like characteristics backed by a body of laws. The European Union has already set up a continental government for 27 countries, which could be a model. The EU 
has a Supreme Court, a currency, thousands of pages of law, a large civil service, and the ability to deploy military force. He went on to say, so could the European model go global? There are three reasons for thinking that it might. Then Rockman goes on to explain the reasons why he believes world government is plausible. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, what a time you and I live in right now. Here we are in the middle of election. The prophecies of the Bible say a system of global governance is getting ready to be set up. And it's not going to turn out good. The Antichrist is going to end up gaining control of it all. But everybody's going to think it's good. It's getting ready to happen. And that has become one of the central issues in the present presidential campaign. I started hearing Mr. Donald Trump speak against globalism. And I thought, does he know what he's saying? Does he understand this stuff? Is he just using a term that he's picked up somewhere? Well, the more I listened, he used it over and over, and it dawned on me. And then he started talking about preserving our borders instead of letting the borders down. And then everybody come in, go out, one world, uh, a world without borders. There's a book out like that. And that's what's happening right now all over the world because they thought they were on the brink of implementing a full one world government. But now we've got this political maverick by the name of Donald Trump who's come along and he said, wait a minute, if we don't enforce our borders, we don't have a country. And we don't like the way things are going right now. America's getting weaker and weaker and, and the world community is getting stronger and stronger and our trade deficits are horrible. I mean, we've been running incredible trade deficits. Why? Because the people who believe in one world government believes that we need to be drained of our resources and given to others until everybody is absolutely equal. Because these people who are globalists also believe in Marxism. They believe in wealth redistribution. I mean, it goes on and on. Now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to fight this fight until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to have the greatest revival the world has ever known. But they're going to keep fighting too. And they're going to get their world government. They're going to get their one world religion and they're going to get their one world economy. They're going to get it. But we believe America can stay out and be a harbor of safety in the days just ahead. We actually have a new DVD, America's God-Given Destiny. And for a donation of any size, I'm talking about any size, simply go to endtime.com, click on the donate button, and whatever donate you, donation you want to make, enter it you'll immediately receive your password to listen to America's God-given destiny. Every American needs to see that DVD because I tell you from the Bible what's going to happen to the United States of America. That's endtime.com. Stay with us. We've got one more segment. I'm taking your calls. In March 2000, I was leading our annual prophecy tour to Israel. We had made the decision to stop by the United Nations before leaving the United States. After taking the tour of the UN, there was a man who was going to give our group a briefing. And here's what he said to us. He said, now some people think that the United Nations is a world government. He said, it's nothing like that. He said, the UN is involved in global governance. And I was stunned when he said it. And I just couldn't resist. I felt like I had to ask the man without abusing him, without taking advantage of him. And so I asked him, uh, sir, could you explain to us the difference between global governance and global government? He stopped and he swallowed a couple of times and he said, you know, that may not be easy. I knew it wasn't going to be easy because I'd already looked it up in Webster's Third International Dictionary. It has a one word definition. The word governance means government. To find out more about our DVDs on world government, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. Well, we're taking your calls in this segment. Uh, the number to call to be on the air with me, 877 
end time. That's 877-363-8463. We're going to get right to the phones right now. Bruce is calling from Illinois. Hello, Bruce. Welcome. Hi, uh, Irving. Uh, thanks uh, for taking my call and uh, great show. Thank you. Um, you know, I was going to call on something else, but uh, I will tell you that I know three different people who are telling me that uh, the uh, IMF uh, will uh, have a, a new currency and, and roll up all the debt into the uh, IMF. And there, there will be um, projects and, and money available for businesses uh, to run projects. And uh, they're saying that the chances of that happening in uh, September are maybe 50-50, but the chances of it happening by October are almost 100%, which I think uh, ties into something that you mentioned earlier. So I, I, I can confirm that from three people and everything's very confidential. Um, but well, you know, Bruce, was, oh. you know, Bruce, that now that you bring that up, let me just make a comment on it before we proceed. Um, the International Monetary Fund, the Bible says that the borrower is servant to the lender. The International Monetary Fund loves to lend money because they then can dictate to the nations what they must do that they loan the money to. They negotiated South Korea into a very difficult economic situation and South Korea did not want to borrow money from the IMF. This happened a few years ago now. But they kept trying to avoid it, but the, the International Monetary Fund used its vast influence to force South Korea into borrowing money. And immediately, the International Monetary Fund made them reform the way they do their business and made them conform to the model of the United Nations. So uh, the International Monetary Fund is one of the very powerful arms of world government to take control of nations. Once you borrow money from them, you become their servant. Right. I, I hear it's going to be China and the U.S. and, and, and the major economies of the world. Uh, and so I've heard from three different sources that uh, that could happen as early as, as 60 days, which uh, may be in the same time timeline that you were talking about. Um, so I, uh, I agree fully. Um, I was going to just ask a, a couple of other things off topic, then. I apologize if you have time. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so the first thing is... is uh, you know, the Garden of Eden, and God said, uh, you know, to Eve and, and Adam, uh, you know, don't take, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, the apple from the tree or you will die. Uh, and they didn't actually die. So was that a spiritual death, uh, you know, that Adam and, uh, and Eve had? And how do you know the difference in the Bible when it's a spiritual death versus an actual death? Yeah, it was absolutely a spiritual death because this whole thing was an obedience test. And the plan of salvation throughout time, no matter what dispensation you lived in, always had an obedience test because mankind was created to live in obedience to God. And when Adam and Eve rebelled and decided to do what they wanted to do, that's when they lost their sonship. The Bible teaches that when they fell, they've lost their status that God originally intended for the human race. And you don't see another human son of God for the next 4,000 years until Jesus Christ, the second Adam came. And through his obedience, he reversed all the damage done by the first Adam's disobedience. And then he created a plan whereby all of us can be restored to spiritual life. The Bible says, until we're born again, we are dead in trespasses and sins. But once we're born again, then we are quickened and we now are restored to the status that Adam and Eve originally were supposed to enjoy, but they lost through their disobedience. So it was definitely a spiritual death. So if you don't believe in, uh, in Jesus Christ and uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, there's a good chance you could still be spiritually dead? Oh, yes, absolutely. The Bible is not a good chance. It's an absolute certainty. Uh, the Bible teaches that uh, in him was light, in him was life, and his life was the light of men. Anyone who does not walk with Jesus Christ is living in a state of spiritual darkness. And that's not to talk down to anybody, but it's just to tell them. Uh, people already really know it. And that's to tell everybody out there that Jesus is the light of the world. And there's no other source of light than Jesus Christ. And if you need light in your life, he's the answer. So, so in the sixth trumpet, it's 
possible that uh, it's talking about spiritual deaths versus uh, actual deaths for one third of mankind, because at that point uh, there may not be a way to redeem yourself after uh, uh, after Antichrist uh, pretty much takes over the world. No, Bruce, I absolutely believe that has to be physical death because the Bible talks about physical soldiers. It talks about a physical river, Euphrates, and uh, so the Bible talks about that war and one third of mankind were killed and that talked about physical armies. So I absolutely believe that's referring to a physical death. So even, even so the armies and the description of the armies and with the tails and, uh, uh, you know, the, the heads of lions and whatever else, you, uh, you know, there's not a possibility that that's uh, actually uh, uh, talking about uh, Satan and... Uh, you know, and and uh, his uh, his his angels uh, uh, coming down. But uh, anyway, I I, uh, I I hear you. You have time for one more quick one? No, I better not because I got a bunch of people lined up behind you and they're waiting. So let me go ahead and get All right. some other Thanks callers. So much. Appreciate it. Okay, appreciate it very much, Bruce. Uh, let's go now to Craig calling from Michigan. Hello, Craig. Welcome back, sir. Yes. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, I wanted to reply to something that you quoted Brother Tony Blair said about a new doctrine, um, a global, I, I referred to it as a global doctrine. I think I read somewhere that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I think I read that in my Bible. So I just wanted to mention that, that there is one doctrine. So... Anyway, well, and what, what you're saying, what you're you, saying, a doctrine is simply a teaching that's held by <clears throat> one or many people. And Tony Blair was specifically referring to: we have to develop a new international doctrine, a new belief system, in a new global uh, uh, government. That's all he was saying. And of course, the church is held together by its doctrine. The Bible says, yeah. take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. In doing this, you will save yourself and those that hear you. So doctrine is very important. Yes. Well, the reason I called, I wanted to ask you about, I know a few years ago, you talked about the head of the school systems, the U.S. school system security, was the same person who created the, I'm not sure what it's called, is it the, uh, the, the gay movement? What is it called? Can you help me there? The LGBT, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Was, do you know who I'm talking about? I, I'm not certain, uh, Craig. It's been a while. The head of our, you, you were talking about, he was the head of our security uh, in the school systems to keep our kids safe and teaching them what is right. And um, it was coming from a, a homosexual man. And... You know what I'm talking about now? Yeah, I vaguely remember, but I'm sorry. I cannot hold it, okay. pull it out specifically. Uh, I think the, the critical thing is this. The federal government usurped authority over the school systems of America back in the early 1960s. And President George Herbert Walker Bush promised that he would abolish the cabinet position of Secretary of Education because they had taken it out of the state's venue and they then put it in a federal government's venue and they said, now we're not going to give you federal money unless you do what we say. And they passed Title IX and a bunch of other things. And so that's the way they uh, captured the mm -hmm. school system. One of the best things that could happen in America is to, de to abolish the federal uh, Department of Education, kick it back to the schools, uh, back to the states, because our level of education has gone down every year almost since the time they did that. The average score on SAT test has gone down since 1963, which, by the way, was the year I graduated, but I can't take any credit for uh, that being the highest point of the SAT test. But anyway, it's an interesting point to consider. I just wanted to find out the man's name. Um, do you know he was in the Obama administration? He appointed, in fact, I think President Obama appointed the man. You talked about him three was, years now. Was his like, name you know uh, in, Benzel Jones? What was his name? 
It might have been Vinzel Jones, but I'm not sure. J-O-N. Well, listen, Craig, I'll town. tell you what. Do you know who's in charge of the of the, the security of the school systems in the U.S. now? Uh, I really don't know how that's governed. Okay. I would assume that your local school board uh, and through the principal of the school has to oversee that and how they enforce those things. I don't really know the answer to that. Sorry, I can't help you on that one, Craig. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, let's now go to Don calling from New Mexico. Hello, Don. Hello, Pastor. Uh, God bless you. I, I did uh, watch Master Plans Dragon. That was a uh, uh, large number. I haven't watched. I, I ordered everything, and I've watched uh, a larger number of them, and have been. Uh, and I've, I've just received an incredible impartation from revelatory impartation, and I, I really appreciate the ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you. And on, uh, with regards to your uh, conversation today and what you're talking about, what I'm kind of looking at is the story in Second uh, Kings chapter 9 of Jezebel and Jehu. And Jehu was, uh, he, he was up against uh, the, in all of the establishment, king of Judah, king of Israel, and Jezebel. But God had anointed him. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, it, it, what was curious to me and what I just wanted to kind of make a comment on, because right now it seems like Donald Trump's in a, in a bit of a bind, but it wasn't until Jehu came to uh, Jezreel and came face to face with Jezebel she had painted herself. She was, you know, made herself look real good. Established, made, it, made herself look real good. Hey, Don, yeah. I'm, I'm just about out of time. I get your point, and I think you've got a great point. Let me just take a moment to comment on it. I'm going to have to let you go because we're totally out of time. But in ca case all of you don't know the account in the Bible, uh, Jezebel and Ahab had ruled Israel, and they had ruled very evilly uh, over Israel. And then when Elisha was to pass, or Elijah was to pass off the scene, he was instructed uh, to anoint Jehu to take the kingship. And Jehu was anointed to go get rid of Jezebel because God had pronounced judgment on Ahab and Jezebel because of their iniquity. And they had taken Naboth's vineyard and they had done a lot of other things that were evil. And Jehu came through. Jezebel tried to entice him like she had been able to do many before him. But instead, he said, throw her down. And he ran over Jezebel with his chariot wheels. So uh, I think uh, that our caller was maybe lightening that a little bit to Donald Trump. I don't know whether all that fits or not. Nevertheless, Less. Let's remember one thing. Donald Trump's not our Messiah. We're going to have great revival no matter who gets elected. However, it may well make a big difference in what happens in this present election. The 800 pound gorilla in the living room is globalism. Two DVDs, National Plan of the Dragon, World Government Forming Now. Become a partner with End Time Ministries. Call 800 End Time. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.